still early, right? Uh, I don't know if you had any power outages the last few days. There's that too. Maybe our alarms didn't go off. Good morning. There we go. <laughs> it's so good, uh, so good to, to hear us as a family singing together, even this morning, uh, just singing about what Christ has done for us. The last few weeks, we've been looking at the last words of Jesus. Uh, we've been looking intently at the laments that he has sung um, and cried out from the cross. Uh, the first week, we looked at Psalm 22, uh, where Jesus, overflowing Psalm 22, says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, last week, we looked at Psalm 31, uh, where Jesus again overflowed and, and said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Um, we are following in the spirit of 2 Thessalonians 3, 5 that says, May the Lord direct your hearts to God's love and Christ's endurance. Uh, the title this morning is... Uh, not the cruciform song of two Sundays ago, not the unchangeable, unassailable song of Jesus last week, but the victory song of his last words, uh, it is finished. Um, if you were at men's retreat four years ago, some of this is going to sound familiar. Um, the reality is, is that there are some words that beg repeating. Our hearts are forgetful. Um, there are things that, that need time to savor uh, and for our hearts to meditate on so that they will fully penetrate our hearts. Uh, this word, it is finished, this expression of Jesus on the cross has had probably more influence on my life than any other word of Jesus. Um, over 20 years, um, it has changed me, transformed me, given me hope, given me comfort. Um, and it is a word that, that there isn't a week that goes by that it isn't somehow rattling in, in my mind and in my heart. And God is continuing to press that uh, and persuade me of, of his love for me. So. We're going to look at that together uh, this morning, um, and we're going to look at Colossians 2.14, which uh, you're going to look at this and say, what does this have to do with Jesus' words, it is finished? This is Paul giving us insight into what Jesus is doing on the cross for us. So Colossians 2, we're going to start reading in verse 13, and then we're going to read through 15. And when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all of our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. So verse 13 of Colossians 2 is, is setting us in the context that God has made us alive. And He has forgiven all of our sins. And we're going to be staring deeply into verse 14 that, that gives us insight into how, how did Jesus do that? Uh, there are lots of things in this passage that, don't, um, that aren't immediately clear to us. And, and really this morning, I'm, I'm looking at three questions uh, together. The first is, what does certificate of debt mean? What is a certificate of debt? That language is foreign to us. What did Paul mean when he said that? Secondly, how was it against us and opposed to us? There's a certificate of debt. What does it mean that it's against us and opposed to us? And then thirdly, how did Jesus take it away by nailing it to the cross? So bear with me because, because we're kind of diving deeply. We're going to be diving deeply into first century Palestine. Um, I'm a geek, I'm a nerd, I'm a lot of other derogatory terms that you could use for me. Um, I just love to geek out on this stuff. 
Um, and as I've said, uh, Paul clarifying, explaining what Jesus is doing on the cross here is, is, is so beneficial to us. So what does certificate of debt mean? If you, regardless of what version of the Bible you're looking at, uh, there's a variety of ways that this term is translated. The NIV says, uh, a charge of our legal indebtedness. The New Living Translation says, the record of the charges. ESV and Holman's Christian Standard Bible is a record of debt. Uh, the CSB, NASB says certificate of debt, as we read this morning. The King James Version says handwriting of ordinance, which is closer word for word uh, from what's happening in Greek to, uh, to English translation. And then the ASV just says the bond. Uh, our core community um, is a diverse group of people, uses a lot of different words all the time. I'm learning words. Um, some of them are Texan, uh, like tumped. I didn't know that tumped was a word until core community started using it. Um, it's a really useful word, turns out, um, but you're going to have to ask the Reese's what that word means. You're not going to hear it from me because I am not an expert on Texan, if you didn't know. Uh, we also use phrases like chuffed, which quick raise of hands. If you don't, if you've never heard the word chuffed, is chuffed negative or positive? So raise your hand if you believe chuffed to be negative. Okay, about half of us. I'm not going to tell you. You want to know what <laughs> you, know, you want to know what chuffed means? You're going to have to talk to Brit after the gathering. Just. Everyone go to Brit and say, what does chuffed mean? She'll love it. Uh, our core community has enough of these moments that there's this running joke that John Weatherford and my wife Brit are going to start this podcast uh, that's called uh, Wait, You Say What, which is awesome. And it's just a podcast full of like, wait, you say what? Because that's how our core community rolls. So if you're into that, come talk to me about core community. I'd love to. Uh, not every core community is as strange and weird as ours. Um, so may you be blessed by that knowledge. OK, so where am I going with this? Slight rabbit trail. Um, how do we know what a word means? Here we have this phrase, a certificate of debt. How do we know what it means? Well. We look at dictionaries, we look at Google, we look at concordances, there's, there's different things that we do. This word, or this set of words in English, certificate of debt, is one word in Greek. Um, and it's the only place in all of the Bible where this word shows up. So looking around at the Bible and trying to get some insight into what this word means, we don't have any other places to go except for Colossians 2.14. In the Greek, this phrase certificate of debt is one word, chirographon. Uh, there you say, see it in front of you. Uh, it's made out of two parts, chiro, where we get uh, words uh, like hand, like chiropractor, a, a worker, someone who is working with their hands, doing magic with their hands to help our bodies, is a chiro hand practitioner. Uh, then graphon, writing, calligraphy, photography, um, graphics, all of these words coming from that Greek word graphon. So we're familiar, it's not a completely foreign word. And together, it just simply means literally handwriting or something that is handwritten, particularly a handwritten document, the chirographon. So if you're looking at the Greek and you're trying to understand what is certificate of debt, what does that mean? The Greek, by looking at a dictionary, a concordance, or whatever, isn't giving us any more information. In fact, it's probably increasingly general, increasingly vague, and we're kind of stuck there with, OK, it's, it's, it's a handwriting. Um, the other place, the, the, the other way to learn what words mean is to look at the context of life, to, to observe life and how words are used. And then in just the observation, you get to see, oh, that's what chuffed means. That's what tumped means. 
There's only so many times where Laura and Travis will kick over a bottle and say it tumped. I think that's the right usage. Again, I could be using this term wrong, so go to correction from the Reese's. But you start to see, oh, wait, this is how this word is used. Um, there is a Turkish word uh, which, uh, if you've been around our family long enough, you've heard this set phrase. We've talked about it before, yavash, yavash. It's our not-so-secret code word for we really need to start leaving. Um, so we say yavash, yavash. It comes from a set Turkish phrase, yavash, yavash, kalkalum. Slowly, we let's rise is what it means. Now, when you observe this in practice, there is nothing slow going on. I mean, sorry, yes, there is nothing quickly going on. It is very much slowly let's rise. It, it starts off this progression of we are about to leave, and maybe an hour later is when you're going to actually leave. So yes, the Gujas are lingerers. It's something that we definitely learned and were encouraged in Turkey. Um, but you have to see that phrase. You don't just see yavash, yavash, and look at the dictionary and see, oh, that means slowly. Until you start observing how the Turkish people say yavash, yavash, it's suddenly imbued with all of this meaning. So here we have this word, karagrafan. What does it mean? Dictionaries, concordances, only get us so far. We have to see how it gets fleshed out, how it lives. And fortunately, it is a word that shows up in first century Palestine. It shows up um, in the time of Paul and how he's writing and informs us. So very quick summary. Uh, Choreographon denotes a document, especially a note of indebtedness written in one's hand as a proof of obligation. So we're going to have to look at how this word lives to see what it means. And you're like, at some point, we're going to wrap up back around and understand how this applies to something Jesus said on the cross. Because right now, David's being really obscure. I know. Bear with me. Philemon 1.19 says this, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. Not to mention to you that you owe me even your very self. This is Paul not using the word choreographon, not saying explicitly handwriting, but describing what a choreographon is. I am writing with my own hand. I will repay it. He, has, he is writing a choreographon and a note of indebtedness. Now, when you look at choreographons in first century Palestine, they really show up in three broad places. The first is, is having to do with the business of loans. Uh, the second is having to do with the business of tax collection. And the third place is then the, the court of law or criminal courts. Uh, loans and loan collection in first century Palestine, very similar to how we process loans today, minus computers. Certainly, no one in that time was going to just take your word and take your assurance that you would repay a loan. But instead, in your own handwriting, with your own signature, you were going to write, this is what I owe. This is how much I owe. This is when I'm going to repay. And I'm writing it in my own handwriting, just like Paul was stating in Philemon. I owe you in my own handwriting. So when they would give that handwriting, that choreographon to the lender, the lender would keep it. They would keep a hold of it. And as long as they held that note, if you ever defaulted on the loan, that person could take that choreographon to court. Say, this person owes me. There it is, their, their handwriting, their, their, their signature, their, this record of, of debt, um, this choreographon exists. And the, the difference in debt collection in those days is how seriously they took it. Um, if this kind of debt was against you, then they could do whatever it took to regain that money, whether it's selling your family um, into, in, uh, into indenture um, or into 
slavery or whatever they needed to sell off in order to reclaim that debt, they could do that as long as there was a choreographon in place. So then your master at that point would hold your choreographon. That's how serious they were about debt collection in those days. But the choreographon was what you wrote in your own handwriting to repay a debt. But when you paid that debt and you went before the lender or you went before the magistrate, they would write out this single word either across or in front of your choreographon. They would write out the word tetelestai. Uh, you see it right there. It means it stands complete. It has been finished. And at any point in the future, you could show that as proof that you no longer owe that debt which was written against you. So this is how choreographon and tetelestai are, are partnered, they're, they're linked, how they live in first century Palestine. The second place we see it is uh, with tax collection. Now, tax collectors were notorious in that day. We have uh, people like Matthew and Zacchaeus, where the New Testament uh, tells us a little bit about their reputation uh, for us. The, the reality is, is if you were traveling roads um, in the Roman Empire, um, in first, second century, you would happen upon roadblocks uh, that would be stationed uh, with a tax collector. And the tax collector would size you up, would take a look at your goods, and they would create a choreographon. They would write out um, what your goods were, your inventory, what you, where you were going, and then they would write essentially a ticket, a, a bill, which was the choreographon, saying you are now indebted to pay this. And so if, if you know, of course, they're, they're very fraudulently adding you know, a percentage, um, that's what makes them notorious, to this bill um, so that they can uh, be rich and certainly very hated. So that assessment of value and the debt that is owed is the choreographon in this case. But if you paid what you owed to pass through, then again, they're writing that word to telestai, across it, in front of it, ensuring that everyone knew that for this amount of goods, this debt has been paid. And so that would stay with you and allow you to keep going on this journey through these roadblocks, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you didn't pay, if you didn't pay what the choreographon spelt out that you owed, then you would end up in this third place, which is the court of law. If you were arrested for a crime in the Roman emperor, either the centurion or, or the officer who makes the arrest, writes out in longhand an accusation. This is the charge uh, that this person is being arrested by. That offense is documented in such a way that when you then go to jail and to your cell, that choreographon is posted above you. It, it's kept with you, ensuring that everyone knows this is the crime um, that you're being tried for. Um, so it's a, a public... Um, record of this debt and this crime. On the day of trial, uh, when your trial is, is prosecuted, the prosecutor presents the choreographon from out of the center of, of the courtroom. That, that place um, in that day is literally known as the middle. We're going to come back to the significance of that. But there in the middle, the judge is reading the choreographon. The prosecutor is saying, this is what he's accused of. And if you're found guilty, the judge may then add the sentence to that choreographon. So that record is staying with the person who's been arrested. You may recall that when, when Jesus died on the cross, uh, there, there are details in the New Testament about the expectation for Jesus particularly and his choreographon. Pontius Pilate, when he is governor, writes this phrase in Greek, Hebrew, and Latin, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. That is Jesus who is 
In Roman Empire, the Roman Empire, a common criminal, therefore accused and arrested and found guilty and being punished under a choreographon. His choreographon says, King of the Jews, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Now, the Jews had issue with this. Uh, if you look at John 19, the Jews are saying, wait, Pontius Pilate, don't write King of Jews. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, write that he said that he was the King of the Jews. The Jews are expecting that choreographon to, to look like all the other choreographons in the empire, to look like an accusation of a crime. His crime was, according to the Jews, that he declared himself to be King of the Jews. Pontius Pilate wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, as a declaration. So you can start to see what the expectations are there for how Jesus is being accused, why he's being crucified. Uh, but certainly one thing is clear, that every criminal in the Roman Empire is being punished under a choreographon. Jesus of Nazareth, no exception. The two criminals next to him, no exceptions. Um, this is the expectation. This is the way that, that the culture, um, hideous as crucifixion is, this is the way things are. Now, if you weren't being crucified, but you were serving your time, whether in a cell or whether by uh, being beaten, that choreographon, after you have completed that punishment, Again, you have that word, tetelestai, written across, written in front, showing you have fulfilled that penalty, and that penalty is no longer binding on you. So again, tetelestai, choreographon, linked. Clearly, choreographon is a legal term. It's exactly how Paul is using it. It's a word that is used to refer to written evidence of a person's guilt in a courtroom, it is a written record of a person's crime. So that is what certificate of debt, all of that meaning is being shoved into one little word, handwriting, and translators are then saying, let's call it certificate of debt and shorthand, and we'll explain to people later <laughs> what we mean. Secondly, then, why was it written against us? Why was it opposed to us? Um, we could spend a lot of time on this, but in short, uh, the evidence of God's existence, when you look at Scripture, when you look at a book like Romans, that, that the evidence of his existence is, is, is self-evident, that it is universal, and therefore no one has an excuse not to worship God. In fact, we belong to God and ought to give thanks to God in, re in a natural response to who he is. And, and that is law. That is the way that the world has, has been designed. But in response, we do the opposite. Romans 1 through 6 goes to great lengths and great detail explaining how how, how the world is created and how the, the creation has been an active rebellion against a good God and how unjust that situation is. These truths are written on our hearts. Our own consciences testify against us. And it's not as if what is written against us is the law. The choreographon isn't the law. The handwriting isn't the law. The handwriting is rather a record of us violating that law over and over and over again. Every utterance, every deed, every, every thought that has been contrary to love and worship of God is, is forming the choreographon, the certificate of debt. Satan is known as the accuser in Scripture. 
he is viewed as holding this choreographon as our prosecutor and saying, here is indisputable proof of guilt. Here is what David has done. Here is what David has said. Here is what David has thought that is contrary to the goodness and faithfulness and mercy and love and justice of God. And that is why this choreographon is very much against us, against David. It's, it's indisputable. It's not based on hearsay. It's based on witnessed fact. And scripture is clear to convey to us that we're not in this courtroom drama right now. We are actually condemned already that Jesus came not to bring condemnation into the world, as John 3 uh, tells us, but rather he came to save a world that was already condemned, that already is in this place of, of guilt, already has our choreographons, are already written sufficiently that, that we are guilty. So then, what does it mean that Jesus nailed this choreographon to the cross? The reality is, is that so many people are being crucified in the Roman Empire that the bare historical fact that a man from Nazareth was crucified really is of little historical value, except for a couple significant things. One is who God is. Jesus is the God-man. He, he came in flesh, and, and, and because of that then, he is the only person who had no choreographon. He has no guilt. He has nothing written against him. He's not deserving of death. And he wouldn't have died except for the fact that he chose to go to the cross in our place. That is what makes Jesus apart from every man and woman. There is no choreographon for Jesus. There is, there is no accusation made against his life and his perfection. He comes spotless and morally uncorrupt to the cross, and he chooses to be on the cross in our place. So then, what separates Jesus is not just who he was, but the fact that when he was on the cross, when they drove the nails into his hands, when he has psalms flowing out of his heart, in lament, and when he has love flowing out of his heart, and he's considering his mother and his disciples and his enemies, and he's extending forgiveness, even while in that moment he is atoning for our sins. In the last few instants of Jesus' life, before he died, he wanted to say something. He's only saying seven things on the cross, and this is arguably the most important word in all of human history. In Matthew and Mark, they don't tell us what he said. They only say that he declared and shouted in a loud voice. But John records the word in John 19.30. It says, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, to tell us Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. And when he died, it was finished. It stood complete. It was paid in full. And the words of Colossians 2.14, our choreographon is taken away. It is literally taken out of the middle, ripped out of the prosecutor's hands, removed from the court, it is destroyed. 
Our choreographon is literally erased, canceled out, blotted out so to leave no trace, obliterated. All of those things is what taken away out of the middle means. As God had already said in Isaiah 43, 25, I am the one. I sweep away your transgressions for my own sake and remember your sins no more. Not on the basis of my worthiness, not on the basis of our deservedness, but for his name's sake, because he is merciful and because he is faithful he declares on the cross that the choreographon is complete. It's been paid in full. It is finished. All associated penalties are null and void. The debt is removed, and the document upon which the debt is written is destroyed. So much so that Isaiah would say, God remembers our sins no more. We cannot fathom the truth of that. In conclusion, it's possible that this morning you are someone upon whom your choreograph on your handwriting, that debt, that record of offense is still hanging over you. And that is the greatest of tragedies in that Jesus has paid everything and done everything and left nothing undone. It is finished. And he says, trust me. Receive what I offer. Take. Come and eat my flesh and drink my blood and take my life. And it's a tragedy to have all the shame and all the guilt and be trying to deal with sin on our own terms when Jesus has left no doubt as to what he's done. So this morning I'm asking, are you dealing with sin on your own terms when you don't need to be? Secondly, I want to ask, are you persuaded of God's love in Jesus? Are you persuaded of the sufficiency of his sacrifice? Every one of us day to day struggle with either minimizing our sin and thinking Christ's sacrifice is of no consequence or thinking our sin is so great that his sacrifice couldn't possibly have our sin in mind. Romans 8, 31 through 34 says that this, and read all of Romans 8. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Paul in Romans 8 says God is for us. To telestai is as rich a word as hesed. The steadfast love of God that doesn't fail on the basis of the God who does not change 
and who is full and abounding with steadfast love and faithfulness. He is for us. He is the judge, and he is for us. And no one can make a case otherwise because we have an advocate. And we have um, someone who has laid his life down, perfect life, and eradicated the debt against us. And so the prosecutor has no evidence. So Romans 8 would conclude with this thought of Paul saying, I am persuaded, I am convinced that nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And he will say that we are more than conquerors. More than conquerors. Through Christ Jesus. And that's how Colossians 2, 14 ends and leads us into verse 15. Let me read that again for you. The whole passage. When you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all of our trespasses. He erased, he eradicated the certificate of debt with its obligations that it was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away. He's taken it out of the middle by nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. The reason that Christ's word to Telestai is a victory song is what Paul is pointing us to. That on the basis of what Jesus, not his choreographer, not being his Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, but rather his choreographer being our record, our certificate of debt, and he nailed it to the cross and declared it is finished. And then he disarmed through that is how he disarmed the rulers, the authority to disgrace them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. The words there are spelling out and pointing the victory parade, the procession through the street of not Rome, but the universe. And Jesus is taking every spiritual power and every evil spirit and the accuser himself, and he is undressing them. He is stripping them naked and taking all of the shame of the world and saying, let the accuser be shamed. Let the certificate of debt be removed for I, Jesus, am victorious. God puts all evil powers on public display as defeated enemies through Christ's death and resurrection. In this short series over the last few weeks, we have been looking at the songs of Jesus on the cross. The, the fullness of meaning that Jesus has, has put into such few words and the fullness of what he is doing on the cross. And at every one of these passages we have seen that the, 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 the goodness, the... the the, the foundation of what gives confidence in those moments is all based on who God is. The first Sunday when we were we talking about, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That Psalm 22 is born out of the fact that God is merciful and abounding in steadfast love, and therefore, he listens to the cries of the afflicted on the basis of his name and on the basis of his character. 
In Psalm 31, when, when Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, it is on the basis of the fact that God is unchanging, that he is a rock, that when he says something, he will do it. When he makes a promise, he will fulfill it. That he is unchanging in his goodness and in his mercy and in his steadfast love. And this word to telestai is no exception because it is born out of the fact that God in his character is a finisher. He is telic in his being. He does not play so many notes of a scale and then leave that last note and then walk off the stage to the irritants of all of us. He, anything that God begins in his character, he is committed to finishing, which is why over and over again, we're going to see things like this out of Hebrews. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. It's the same root of Tetelestai. He's the finisher. He's not just the beginner. He's the finisher, the completer. It is what Jesus does. It is what God is. Philippians 1, 6, also another place, says this, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Just as confidently as we can stand on Jesus' final words on the cross to tell us die, we can stand on the fact that what he has begun in your life, in my life, Jesus is committed to finishing. As, as unending or as uncompleted as things may seem now, that in him, he is working to finish it and it will be completed. On the basis of my deservedness? No, on the basis of who God is. So the last question is a big question, is a daily question. It doesn't matter your age. It will be a question that you will continue to ask. But are you trusting that God is who he is? This is what Jesus' last words are pointing us to. Who God is. So then, in the words of Thessalonians, and in the, the echo of Thessalonians, we can stand firm. Stand firm. Be steadfast. Be immovable. On the basis of our circumstances? No. On the basis of how I feel today? No. On the basis of my expectations? No. On the basis of who God is? Let's pray. Father, we have so much to hope in and so much to, to take joy in. And our hearts um, are heavy sometimes and sometimes they are hardened. We ask that by your spirit, you would help us to hear um, who you are, to see more and more who you are and to trust and who you are. God, give us joy, give us hope, give us fullness, because you are the all in all. In Jesus' name, amen.